Hello everyone and hope all of you are well. So on popular request I am now presenting the long awaited P3 practicals woohoo. Alright. So for the P3 practicals now obviously we will be able to do only a limited discussion because we don't have the apparatus which would be displayed here. So this is uh, how I'll take it is that in this first video we'll just be talking about question number one and in a separate video we'll be talking about question number two. Right, so that's how we're going to take it. So with question number one you know that question number one involves actually doing an experiment taking some sets of values and then also graphing them and so on. Using the graph then we calculate the value of some constants and that's how it goes. So first off let's just talk about the general tips which are involved with doing question one and then we'll go on to the particular ideas that could be discussed in a specific experiment. So first off I'm just going to start off with some general tips and advice about performing the experiment itself just some general tips. So first of all whenever you are doing an experiment do make sure that you do it entirely you do your best and also there could be a case where you have a experiment in a center which is maybe not really uh, good with those apparatus because I remember that for example my chemistry practical I was just pouring a indicator and the color change was not just coming about. So the first idea to remember here is that you should not panic. Right? Whatever happens in your experiment even if you can't do the experiment at all which is going to be very rare because you guys have also been doing here uh, you guys have also been doing practicals throughout the entire year it's going to be very rare but even then you can still get a good A grade on your practicals. So the first thing is to don't panic at all with any experiment that you get. The other one is also to not obsess with the experiment and the perfection of the readings. When you are actually going to be doing your practicals it will be such that because of space limitations someone will be doing question one of the practical and another student who you will be sharing the apparatus with will be doing question number two. So don't take too much time in setting up the apparatus. This is what question number one. In question number one you will generally be following very good experimental practices so you won't have to comment on any of that in question number one because you'll also be doing averaging. You'll be making sure that your readings are accurate, you're doing, uh, you're trying to take care of the parallax error that's how you're viewing your readings for example. So this is just some stuff. But again another thing which actually kind of correlates with not obsessing over the experiment and the perfection of the readings too much is to uh, not try to do every every precaution that you can take to have exper to have your experiment as accurate as possible you shouldn't be doing this in question number one right the worst that will happen is that if you do not take the most care to do your experiment properly your points are going to be slightly off and I'll talk about that in a while as well. But do not try to do everything in your power to make your experiment turn out fine. So for example maybe you're measuring some length using a meter rule. Don't also take up another clamp and tie it to a clamp unless the ex uh, experiment explicitly states so which is different. But otherwise on your own don't try to make it as perfect as you can. So these are just some general tips. Because in my A-levels I also remember that a friend who was doing a practical he was doing a question two I guess and somebody else was doing a question one and the guy who was from another school altogether he was doing question one with he had something related to springs and the 30 or the 35 minutes that he had to do the practical he was just focused on making the perfect spring and he couldn't get done with any of the other parts of the experiment as such but my friend was in luck because he didn't have to do anything and he just made that perfectly he just picked up that perfectly made spring and he continued with it with uh, that question when it was his turn to do so. So don't panic don't obsess with the experiment at all. 
right? So just manage to keep your nerves in check. Now for this one, I am going to be discussing a actual paper and with values that I have taken while doing the experiment just so that we have a proper exam feel of it. So this is the paper that I have done the experiment for beforehand and we are going to be discussing the grading and the criteria regarding this. Uh, regarding question number one with the help of this example question. So this circuit is provided to you beforehand so you don't need to build this up from scratch. What you do need to do is this that you will be provided groups of parallel resistors which you then connect in the component holder and that you just connect in series with a resistor R from this point. Right. So from this point you just connect it in series. So this point would be very obvious to you this is the other end of the capacitor, capacitor which is not connected to the two-way switch. You just connect the resistor R in series here and the uh, component holder which is then going to be connected with crocodile clips back to the other end of the switch. Ensure that the switch S is in position 2. Alright, so this is also done. Record the number N of parallel resistors in the component holder. So the way that I was given this the number of resistors is exactly what's shown here that we have these two. So the number of resistors in parallel in this case are two. Then we close the switch A. So we close this switch and we record the voltmeter reading V. In my case it turned out to be 2.96 volts. Right? Units are part of the answer. So make sure you write them. Then we open A. This is our first mark secured. Then we close A. Move S to the position 1 and start the stopwatch. The voltmeter reading will immediately become negative and then gradually increase. So this is what you are supposed to observe. Stop the stopwatch as soon as the voltmeter reading passes 0 and becomes positive. Record the time t as shown by the stopwatch. So when I did this experiment, I Alright, so let me also talk about this entirely. So there is some reading between the lines which is associated with some of these initial parts related to question number one, which is that this question is worth two marks. Sometimes you'll also have a question which is just worth one mark. Whenever you have a question which is worth two marks, there is one mark for you taking multiple readings and averaging. So once I took the time, this turned out to be 10.34 seconds. The other one for me this turned out to be 10.40 seconds. So the average in this case if you want to do this the average turns out to be 10 the average turns out to be 10.37 seconds. So I'm not doing anything on my own I'm not thinking about the human reaction time which would be involved so we would usually do this to one decimal place if human reaction time we are considering but this is just as shown by the stopwatch so this is how I write this which is 10.37 seconds. Then you move the S the switch to position 2 and you open A right. So this was worth 2 marks just because you had to also average this out here. Next part, by using different groups of resistors, change N and repeat B until you have six sets of values of N and T. So in this one what you had to do is if you go back to the component holder here. So this component holder uh, was uh, containing that groups of parallel resistors, right? So you had two, three, four, five, six. So you have all of these and you just need to connect them. You don't need to do anything else. So just connecting them is going to give you the different sets of readings. Now if you're also just thinking about this at the same time as you are doing the experiment, I guess that all of you can see that N here is my independent variable. Right? Because that's what I'm going to change myself here. So N is my independent variable. And at the same time, you will also identify. So you saw that we are going to have a couple of readings here. 
I always do this one, even though it's not really required per se, which is serial number. There was n, the number of resistors. There's going to be one time T1, which is in seconds. Also, I personally always prefer slashes, which is also the technically more correct way, uh, rather than brackets, because when you use a slash, then you could also have a unit which has brackets, so it just makes it better with the slash than to have two brackets of varying sizes. There's going to be T average then. And if you look at what was asked here, you also have to have values of one over n here, right? So this is what our table is going to look like. Let's start filling this up now. So this is our uh, column headings. Actually just forgot T average here. Let's also write its units. N is just the number of resistors, so no unit. Similarly, one over N will not have any values either. So we have a total of six readings that we need to do. This is the minimum number of readings that you have to do. And this is what I always suggest you do. Never be over efficient and risk running out of time. And in, the, and in these six values, you can also use the values that you had previously. So for n equals to 2, I had t as 10.37. So first off, let's just fill this in. So my n equals to 2. I had 10.34. This was 10.37. And sorry, this was 10.40. And my t average was 10.37. And 1 over n is obviously going to be 0 0.5 here. Right? Because this is also 1SF. This could also just be 1SF. You could also make this 2SF. So because I'll also have other values here, let's make the 0 0.50. Now in this case, the apparatus which was available was going all the way to a group of seven resistors. So you should be also maximizing your entire range, right? And then for the minimum as well, the idea here that few candidates realized was that N can also be zero you could connect no components here and you would still be getting a time, right? So you could also do this. So the minimum value could also be n equals to zero here. And if I didn't do n equals to zero, I just went from one and I actually skipped three to get to seven and I did, did this for four, five, six and seven. So for one, my readings turned out to be this, 19. Point 1019.50 which gave me 19.30 as this and 1 over n turned out to be 1.00 for 4 I got the values as 8.57 and another one was 7.68 8.57, 7.68 divided by 2, so 8.125, so I'll write this as 8.13, and then for the fifth one, I got 5.64, 5.43, divided by 2 is 5.535, so 5.54, for 6, I got 4.82, 4.72, so 4.76 is the average in this case. And then for the last one, the seventh one, I got 3.88, 3.88. Nine seven, just 3.925, so 3.93. And then I'll just fill up these remaining 1 over n values. So 1 over 3 is going to be 0.33. 1 over 4 is 0 0.25, 0 0.20. And 1 over 7 is 0 0.142, so 0 0.1 is the value we get. 
So we plot a graph of t on the y-axis against 1 over n on the x-axis. So t average is on our y, the other thing is on the x. Let's just take a picture of these values to take. So these are our values because that's what I'll use to keep the, I'll use to select the ranges. So T is on the Y axis. So I'll write T here, the T average, which is T in seconds. And I have one over N on my X axis. So this is one over N, which has no units whatsoever. So first off, let's just think about the choice of the scales. So as far as the x-axis goes, it makes no sense to take a false origin because these values go from 0 to 1. Right? So let's take a set of values that satisfy all of our needs here. So we just need to go from 0 to 1. And we're going to two decimal places. So how about this, that we take this as 1, 2, so 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. This does not work. So 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. This will work. The idea is that when you have to mark the axes, they must be such that you use up at least half of the grid. If you do not use up half of the grid using any choice of scales, you will lose marks, right? So let me also, I should have done this. Let me do this here. So for the previous parts, we just talked about what the marking is on, uh, how the marks are given on that basis. For this one, you have one mark for six readings and the correct trend, which we do get here. And that trend is this, that T is decreasing as N is increasing, right? So T goes down. So six readings, correct trend, that's the first mark. The next mark is for the range. In this case, we had the range for uh, the minimum value being one, the greatest value being seven, which was the greatest number of parallel resistors. You should always aim to use up as much of your range as you can. And these do not need to be equally spaced, right? you just need to use the max and the min value. So the max and the min in any case you should use. The third one is column headings, which must contain a proper unit. And also if you look at the mark scheme, the mark scheme accepts slashes, not brackets. It would, it does actually accept brackets, but slashes are the standard. The next one is called a mark for consistency. And in this case, the consistency was for the values of t, which should all be given to either 0 0.01 seconds, as we did, or keeping in mind the human reaction time, it must be 2.1 seconds. And the last one was the calculation mark, which is arguably the easiest mark to get, which is just to say that you should have done all of these calculations correctly. So like, uh, like a toddler, you just should know what one over seven equals on the calculator, and you should be able to read off that value. So that's what the marks were for there. Now, when we talk about the graph, so there are now marks for the scales. So one mark is for the axes here. So for the axes, you must use like proper sensible scales. Some people, I don't know why, they also do this that they just plot up all of these values that they have on the x-axis for each box, which is obviously the most uh, stupid thing that you could do on a practical because then all of the boxes would not be the same size, right? And you are choosing the scale so that it occupies more than half of the grid in both directions. We just did this for x. We will also be doing this for y. Labeling of the axes, this is also included in that one mark. And the scale markings which are done here, they should be no more than three large boxes apart, right? You should label all of these, ideally. So you should do 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, but this would also work. So these are what the marks are for regarding the axes. 
So let's look here. So we have values going up from 4 to 20. Again, uh, no need really to use the false axis here. I mean, you could, but you don't really have to. So here, what we are going to do is, again, we want to go up to 20. So let's see what we can use. Let's just zoom out first and see how the graph is. So if we do this 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 14, 16, 18, 20. Maybe I messed up in the middle, but 20 will fit uh, with the scale. So let's just do this, which is to make this two. This one is four. This one as six. This one as eight. This as 10. Also as a general guide, you should never have a distance of more than two boxes, like two large boxes between uh, the markings. So 10, then we have 12, 14, 16, 18, and our final value was 19.3, uh, so yeah, 20. So it does uh, like capture all of that. So in this one also, we did cover more than uh, half of the range, half of the spaces which were available here. Now that all of this is done, now it's time to plot correctly. So one mark is for doing the plotting of all the points that you've done. So you need to have six points here. So that's what one mark is for, which is, uh, again, one mark is not for that. This is one of the criteria. And when all of those criteria are fulfilled, you get the entire one mark here. So on the topic of plotting, let's start plotting these points. So the first one is on the x-axis 0.14, y-axis 3.93. So let's start here, 0.14, 3.93. So this would be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and we are looking for 3.93. So this would be 3, 3.2, 3.4, 3.6, 3.8, 3.9, .3 or 3.93 for that matter. So now that this is done, let's go on to the next one, which is 0 0.2, 4.76. So 0 0.2, 4.2, 4 4.4, 4 4.6, 4.8, so 4.76, I would draw slightly upwards, like this probably. Also, uh, another thing to keep in mind is that whenever you're plotting, you need to have a really sharp pencil when plotting this uh, graph, or any other graph for that matter. Because if you have a plot, if you have a point which is larger than half of a small square, you will lose marks. So there should not be blobs, right? They should be really small points. Also, I get this question a lot of times that should it be a cross or a dot? And I always prefer dots because it's easy to see the original point. With a cross, you might mess that up and then you don't know what the line should pass through. So that's these two points. Next one is 0.25 and 5.54. So 0.25 would be right in the middle of 0.2 and 0.3 and 5.54. So 5.54 is somewhere along here, right? Again, my points is going slightly blobbed here, but they really shouldn't be. But again, I can't help it. You guys can, so you guys should take care of this. So this is that. Next one, I have 0.33 and 8.13. Uh, so 0.33 and 8.13. So this is 0 0.3, 0 0.32, and 0 0.34, so 0.33, 8.1. 3, so it's going to be somewhere in the middle here. So 8.13, where did it go? Somewhere in the middle like this. Right, let's see if I did this correctly. 
because it sli seems slightly off. So 0.3 would be right in the middle, 0.32 and 0.33 and 8.13. So yeah, this looks about right. Then there is uh, 0.5 and 10.37. So 0 0.5, 10.2, 10.4, 10.5, 10 10.37 looks like this. And there's one comma 19.30. So one comma 19.3. Let's again see where one is. So this is one, all right. So 19.3. So this is 19.2.3. Let's try again. Yeah. So let's see 19, 19.2, 19.4. So 4, 6, 8, and 20. So this is matching up. Right, so this is the plotting which is now done. Let's have a look at all the points together now. So why does it feel like I have less points? No, it's actually fine, right? One, two, three, four, five, and six. So these are all of my points. Now, for the plotting, so plotting is also done, right? So the plotting of the points, the third uh, thing that you have to consider is that the plotting is actually accurate, which is why I double checked this point, which was seemingly anomalous. A lot of the times when you find a point which is anomalous, sometimes it could be that actually the reading is like this, but the first thing you should do is to always double check your plotting. So the points and the plotting should be accurate to half a small square, right? The third uh, thing to consider here is the quality. So about quality, what's the idea is that the trend must be correct as was also uh, the case in the table so that it must have an overall correct trend for you to draw this line and all of the points must be plotted and even if you do take let's say if you don't take six readings which is quite much uh, the standard if you take five in any case you must be plotting five points here and now you have to draw a straight line that is within plus or minus one large square from a straight line in the t direction. Now what does this mean is that overall here if you look at the graph this graph should be uh, there must be a straight line which is drawn right it must be possible to draw a straight line like this. Now sometimes what might happen is because of your readings and I'm talking about the very worst case here sometimes you might not be able to do this in that case you would end up losing the quality mark but please do not let this affect the rest of your question one marks which you can still gain. The nice thing about practicals is that all marks are independent. So if you do lose this mark, it will not affect the rest of the marks that you could gain. So now that I have this and I can see here that if I make a line, so that line looks like uh, this almost. So let's try to make the line. Now again, when you're doing this, actually you will need to use a transparent scale so that you can see the spread of the points about this line. So let's say this is how the line looks right now. But again, it's not the best line that I could possibly draw. Let's try to get this a bit like this maybe. Now for this case, the best line I could reach was this one. And in doing so, I'm not considering this point. So this one I am taking as an anomalous point. Again, this is all I did after actually seeing and trying out the line of best fit. But I could, no matter what I did, I could not fit this onto my line. So I took this as an anomalous point. Please, please try to have a line so that it does not have an anomalous point. Sometimes you will just have an anomalous point and you will not be able to help it as was my case here. Because you also should keep in mind that you don't really have marks for marking this anomalous point. 
and also you can't have like more than two anomalous points out of six. You need to have four points which are plotted on the graph, right? So no more than two anomalous points. So then the next mark is for drawing the line of best fit, which by the way, let me also inform, I'm not scoring here because of how thick my line is. So for the line of best fit, the idea is that obviously for the drawing of the line of best fit, there must be an even spread of points about uh, the line, right? And in this case, you are only allowed one anomalous point as was our case. And what I was saying is where I would not gain the mark is because of how thick my line is right now. And I just can't help it. But you should draw it such that your line is very, very thin and you should draw it with a really sharp pencil and in one smooth movement. So that uh, basically avoids overwriting and overdrawing on that line. So we also got the line of best fit mark. It is suggested that quantities T and N are related by this equation where A and B are constants. Use your answers in D3 to determine the values of A and B. So actually before this, we did, uh, we also have to do the gradient and y-intercept uh, part. So we just need to pick up two points and for the two points, the uh, two points must be greater than half of the line apart. So they should be really, really far apart. And also because in this case, we didn't really use a, what do you call it, false origin. So we can also get the y-intercept straight from the line. So playing around with the line, I got this as thin as I could here. And now I need to pick up the two points for the marking of, for the calculation of the y-intercept and the gradient. So let's say one point here is going to be just the y-intercept here, which is this point, it seems like, which right here is zero comma, so one, 1.2, 1.3. So one point is zero comma 1.3. Another point, let's pick this up closer to the top half of the line. So this one, let's say it's this point right here. So for this point, I know that this is, uh, the Y coordinate is 24. Now I just need to see what the X coordinate is. So this one would be 1.2. So now I can see what the y coordinate here is. So this would be 1.3. So this is one point two eight comma twenty four. So I now have both the points. So zero comma one point three, one point two eight comma twenty four. So the gradient. So I always have a habit of first writing down the points. And the other one was 1.28 comma 24. So gradient change in Y over change in X. So 24 minus 1.3 over 1.28. So this turns out to be 17.7 to 3SF. And the y-intercept I just got directly, which is 1.3. Now do take care that your significant figures are reflected according to the data that you worked with. Now what I mean by this is on our y-axis, we had our time, which was uh, three significant figures and four significant figures. So your gradient and your y-intercept should reflect that. So if this thing, I am also going to keep to 3SF, so I should write this as 1.30. Now with this done, I go on to the next part. It is suggested that these quantities A and B are constants in this equation. Use your answers in D3 to determine the values of A and B. Give appropriate units. So the first thing here is to just apply linear law and look at what you have plotted on your X, what you've plotted on your Y axis, this is what you plotted on your y. This is what you plotted on your x. So this entire thing with the x is your gradient. So A is the gradient and B is the y-intercept. Now about the units, 
the gradient since it was y over x it's also going to have units of y over x so it's going to be seconds divided by nothing so it's just seconds and similarly the y intercept is going to have units of only the y uh, only the units of whatever you have on the y axis so that's also seconds just in this case so a was 17.7 and b the y intercept is 1.3 zero so that's how you do question number one so in this part the marks are for correctly seeing what the gradient is equal to what the y-intercept is equal to right so this is how you do question number one of the practical paper so today we are going to be discussing question number two of your practical paper and because the practical paper is uh, in my opinion it's at least easier than your question number one so for this I don't have a particular question that I'm going to discuss here rather it's just going to be very general so we're doing B3 practical question number 2 is what we'll be discussing today so with question number 1 the idea was that you had to do an experiment and you had to do it basically the experimental practices outlined there were to the best that you could do which is why I suggested back in that video that you don't really need to think about it all too much as to how you want to do this but in this one you also have to perform an experiment but what will help you while doing this experiment is that while you're actually doing this and while you're taking readings and doing all of this you would also benefit a lot when you analyze the experimental practices so if you analyze the techniques and practices this is going to be very very helpful for you when you get to a later part which is actually the part that a lot of students have troubles with so in a first part you will also have to you will always have to take some measurements and then maybe you have related to those measurements you have to do the percentage uncertainty you know things like that so according to your according to your uh, instrument of choice how do you find the percentage uncertainties so for that purpose let me here make a small table of the different instruments that you could use and what are their percentage uncertainties here so these are some common uncertainty values for the lab instruments that we have some of these are missing here and I'll talk about how you find the uncertainties for those as well so remember this idea that the uncertainty is really just the least count or what is also called the smallest scale division for all the instruments right now you might be thinking about the half of the smallest scale division that is correct for spot readings which is that if you're just reading off one end but usually for example with the case of a meter rule we have to align both ends of our object along the rule so these are things that you have to take care of when talking about uncertainties so it's the least count so in the case of a micrometer it's 0 0.01 meters meter rule it's 0 0.1 centimeters calipers it's this protractor it's one degrees and stopwatch this is 0 0.01 seconds now this is what the uncertainties are on paper for all of these instruments but you should also remember this idea that when we are talking about uncertainties while actually doing the experiments the uncertainty could very well increase for example if you are taking the meter rule reading along something which is dangling in the air then the uncertainty is going to be more than this value on paper if you are measuring the angle between let's say two really thick rods of steel then you don't know where the middle of those uh, steel rods would be so again the uncertainty would be more than one degree so always when analyzing uncertainties remember that the uncertainties could increase in an actual experiment because this is also asked a lot in your question number two when you have to measure something and then they ask you to think about what the uncertainties are so you may also be asked to calculate percentage uncertainties then based 
on the values of the absolute uncertainties that you found. So this is one of those parts. And another part that you have, you also sometimes have to justify the use of some number of significant figures. So you will have to use something. So you will uh, like measure something and then you will be asked to calculate something using your measurements. And you then have to justify why you have used the number of significant figures that you have used in your answer. So the answer to this question is pretty basic. It's uh, very much related to what you study in AS chapter one, which is that your final answer, whatever you calculate, it's number of SF, the number of significant figures, should be equal to the least number of SF in your data or it could be one more than that. Right, so let's say if you are calculating something, you have something in 2SF, 3SF, 4SF, and now you've calculated this, what should you give your answer correct to? So because you have something which is 2SF, actually let me write here, you have something 2SF, 3SF, 4SF. So now you've calculated your answer here. Now because the least number of significant figures are two, you can give your answer to two or to one more than that, which is three significant figures. So this is some stuff that you must keep in mind. Also another part that you have is when you take those two readings and you uh, like calculate everything which is associated with this, then you have to test some relationship given to you. And don't be nervous because it's not the type of relationship that you're thinking about. It's a mathematical equation that you have to test. So how are you going to test the relationship of such and such variables in this case? So you will be given some relationship like, uh, let's take a very easy case. Let's say you have a relationship like this. So you measure some variables y and x and the examiner tells you the relationship is this and you will be expected to calculate two values of k. Now let's say your k1, and this is just examples that I'm making along the way as I go on. Let's say k1 turns out to be like 12.9, uh, and k2 turns out to be 14.5, uh, right? And again, also sometimes you may be asked to justify the values of k, so remember that you apply the same analysis here that out of y and x square, whatever is the less uh, number of SFs, you give your answer according to that. So let's say here this was, the least count was 3SF, so you gave your answers to 3SF, right? Now sometimes you will be asked to also uh, do this. Sometimes this will be very explicitly stated as a part of the question. Other times you will have to do this, is now that you will be asked to justify whether the relationship is valid or not. So based on the values that you have calculated, is the relationship valid or not? Now in a lot of the recent papers, you do have this, that you are given uh, this idea that both of these values must be within 10%. of each other. So this is what you have to work with most of the time. But let's say sometimes it's not given and you are just asked to support. So now let's say that you have to use your results to say whether this is valid or not. Even if this value is not given, you can take it to be 10% all the time, right? So here what I would do is now I have to see whether my results are within 10% of each other. So I just find their percentage difference now. So I take the difference of the two, divide by one of these, and multiply this by 100. So for example, in this case, I have 14.5 minus 12.9 over 12.9 times 100. If some of you find this formula hard to remember, again, you don't even really need to learn it by heart. It's just common sense. You can take 10% of this, add it here, and if this lies within the range, so let's say 12.9 plus 10% of 12.9, 10 
maybe this uh, turns out to be like uh, 14. But your 14.5 is out of that max range, this would not satisfy that relationship. So similarly, if I do this calculation here, 14.5 uh, minus 12.9 divided by 12.9 times 100. So this is just shy of 12%. Right, so this is what my value turns out to be, which now I would say, which is more than 10%. So I would say this relationship is not valid in this case. Right, so that's how you have to do these parts. Right, so this stuff is very, very easy. Let's go on to the real stuff that a lot of you guys have been asking me for, which is the idea on errors and improvements to the experimental techniques. So with errors and improvements, you obviously know that one thing you can always write as a error, and this is how exactly all of your question twos will go, is that you have to take two readings, right? So for these two readings, you can say two readings are not sufficient to draw a conclusion about the experiment. Right, for all we know, it could be that one value is perfectly fine and another one is what we would uh, classify as question number one as an anomalous value. So obviously two are not sufficient to draw a conclusion. And then the solution to this problem is to say that take at least six readings plot a graph and then draw your conclusions. Right, so this is what you can always say no matter what the question. So you cannot write just uh, some phrases and expect the examiner to give you marks. So you just can't write uh, too few readings or not accurate enough results, you know, things like this. You need to be super clear in what you want to say. But honestly, if anybody has even done like two experiments on question two, they know that this is something they can always write. So what I'm more interested in is some of the other conclusions, some of the other errors you write, and what improvements do you write for those. Now, as a general rule of thumb, do remember that you should never write these things. So first of all, never write unclear statements. In which it's not immediately apparent that what uh, measuring which value was difficult because of a certain feature of the experiment or uh, how the improvement could improve that measurement. All of this must be very clear in your experiment in whatever you want to describe in your errors and improvements. It must be very clear that why was this thing difficult and how does the improvement make this, uh, the measurement of such and such thing easy. So it must be very clear. Another thing is to not write just short phrases. And again, this actually really does follow from the idea of unclear statements is that if you just write short phrases like maybe something like reaction time, or if you say that it's difficult to measure this, without specifying clearly why is it difficult to measure this and this thing, this is going to be wrong. Reaction time will be there in any experiment where you have to operate a stopwatch, right? But you should explain that why maybe like for one oscillation, the reaction time is a pretty big proportion or a pretty big fraction of it. So it leads to a high percentage uncertainty. Maybe you can talk of that kind of thing. Another thing here, and also something else that you really have to think about when you're writing these improvements is to not write down anything that can improve the accuracy of the experiments while you're taking the readings.
while you're still doing the experiment. So for example, you can never write this that you should take multiple readings and average them because you could do this while you were still doing the experiment. Similarly, you should never write that place your eye perpendicular to the mark being read to avoid parallax error because this is part of things that you should be doing anyway. Right? So you just need to keep an eye out for these that you should never write this. So never write anything you could have done while doing the experiment. So these are changes that we're not talking about here. Instead, we want to look at changes that can really improve the experimental technique of how lens could be measured of some or something like that. So just saying that you can average this or you can like uh, look at the readings properly. So this is not uh, what you will be given marks on. So instead, you have a lot of improvements that you can write. And I've basically split them down into some themes of some types of questions and what you can always or actually not even always sometimes you can write them when you think about this scenario according to what you have at hand. So the first kind of uh, like this broad category that we're talking ab about here that could be related to length measurement here. And generally if I don't say anything this means I'm talking about length measurement using a meter rule. So what could be different errors that can arise in this case? So for length measurement, let's talk about the different errors which can happen. So these are some common problems that you can run into when using a meter rule most commonly for measurement of some lengths. So for example, if your rule is not vertical, again, if you just in your experiments write this, that the rule is not vertical and you do not talk about what becomes difficult as a rule of not as a result of the rule not being vertical so the measurement of what length becomes difficult you will not get the mark now because i'm talking about this generally that that is why i've just written this if i were to write this in an exam i would say that it's difficult to measure this thing because the rule is not perfectly vertical so what can you do to ensure that the rule is vertical is that you can use a set square which is that uh, triangle that you have in your geometry boxes. So you can use that to ensure that the rule becomes vertical. So you can place the rule basically along this length and this will ensure that it's vertical. So this will ensure that the rule is basically parallel or sorry perpendicular to maybe the floor if both of these are positioned on a bench. The next one could be difficult to place I perpendicular to the mark Again, this will happen in different experiments based on uh, the setup that you have to make that sometimes it's not going to be very easy to place your eye perpendicular to the mark to avoid parallax error, right? Now as a solution, you cannot just say that you have to then place your eye perpendicular to the mark because this is something that you could do during the experiment. You cannot write this. So what you can do in this case is for example, if you are taking the lens using a metered rule, you could do with a pointer on the rule or a pointer on the mark being read. Right, so a pointer can help you uh, basically see that mark really well. Sometimes what we also do to uh, avoid this parallax error is that we use a source of light to project shadows and then we read off the lens from what the shadows tell us. Similarly, if you have a moving rule or if the rule is slipping, then you can mount the ruler in a stand. Or for example, if the rule is slipping, then you can provide it with some supports, right? You can glue it in place as well. Sometimes because you have to measure some strings, so sometimes the string is too thick for it to be read properly on a rule. In that case, you can use thinner strings and that can help you with this problem. Sometimes you'll also have to measure lens from the center of some ball or the center of a block and sometimes it could also be really difficult because if that block or if that ball is moving let's say you're timing the bounces of a ball so then it could be really difficult to see what that is. 
right? So for that case, you can use uh, a lot of the times, for example, if you are looking at something which is in motion, you can use a camera and then play back pr frame by frame to see exactly what is that height that it goes up to. So that is what you could do in cases where you have something moving, right? Maybe you have a pulley system and a block is uh, moving around the pulley and you want to measure some length associated with that. So you can also look at that or you can also first determine the center. Determine the center of the ball or the block and you can mark it. Just so again it becomes easier to see how the length will be measured according to that. So about this Again, we are going to be doing some time related errors and improvements and this is not just related to time, but rather it's very general. So these are some of the most common ones related to time and they may seem like a few because a lot of the times many of the time related errors and improvements fall into the first point, which is that for example, if you're observing the bouncing of a ball or let's say you're observing the oscillations of a pendulum, then it's going to be difficult for you to see the starting and the ending positions. So like the top of the bounce or like the extreme right of the pendulum in an oscillation. So for this, the one that I prefer the most is to record the oscillations or the bouncing using a video camera and playing back playing back frame by frame. Right, so this will allow you to have a look at everything in slow-mo as it happens. Right, so this is one of the improvements. And again, some precautions rega regarding this is that if you just say use a video camera and if you do not write this as a improvement, you will not get the mark. If you say I'll use an assistant, you will not get the mark. If you say I use a CCTV or a computer or anything of that sort, you will not get marks, right? As long as you do not talk about how this improves the measurement of whatever was difficult in as a design of that experiment, you will not get the mark. Similarly with the bouncing of the ball or the oscillation, sometimes you might also have this problem that you might be thinking that this time interval, maybe let's say a second, is really hard for you to time keeping in mind the human reaction time. As an error, never write human reaction time. Again, this falls in categories one and two of the things that we told you to never to do, which is just writing small phrases unexplained and not talking about what is difficult as a result of the human reaction time. Again, human reaction time will always be there. What you can do is that instead of a small time interval, whatever you are doing there, let's say you're dropping a, a ball from a height, or maybe you have, so maybe you have different lengths of the pendulum as well. So you should change your values, whatever variables you have in such a way that you have a greater time to measure. And you should also explain what the impact of this is which is that it makes your human reaction time a smaller fraction of the actual time. So this reduces the percentage uncertainty in this way. And sometimes you might have an experiment on terminal velocity as well, where you are timing, where you are looking at something and how it reaches terminal velocity. This is not even really all that time related, but to see but to ensure that terminal velocity is reached, you can let it fall and check to see if the time, for example, between certain marks which are placed, maybe there is a meter rule on the side. So check to see if the time between uh, similar, actually let's say this, between identical distances is constant. So maybe if it takes like uh, one second to fall, maybe eight centimeters. So in the next second as well, it should fall eight centimeters, right? So these are some things that you should take care of. After this,
the next one that we are doing is experiments related to heat. Sometimes you have to measure some temperatures and maybe you have to find like different values for it. So what are some precautions that you can always talk about? Some errors that you will always encounter and some precautions that you can always also talk about. So in some experiments you can obviously talk about heat loss as an error which maybe caused your readings to not be very accurate. And maybe this is something you got from one of the earlier parts where you had to compare the constants. And maybe you saw that heat loss could be a possible reason for your k-values not being within a certain range. So as a solution to heat loss, you can always introduce lagging or insulation to prevent heat loss from your beaker. Sometimes when reading uh, some temperature values, you might have a bulb of the thermometer which is not completely immersed in the liquid and hence it causes it to not have a correct value. So as an improvement, you can always say that uh, you should use more liquid so that the bulb of the thermometer is completely immersed in the liquid. Sometimes you'll also have this that when you are taking readings, you will find that the temperature on the thermometer rises even after you take the reading. So maybe you are using an electrical heater even after you turn it off, the temperature keeps rising. So the way around this is to wait until you have a max temperature reading. And again, this is something that you might also do as part of the experiment. But when the examiner is checking your work, when he's checking your paper, what you've written down, he won't know that you've done this in your experimental practice. It's good experimental practice. You are supposed to do this. But if the examiner doesn't know it, you can still write it as a possible source of error. And you can also give this improvement that you already know of because you've done it anyway. Let's go on to a different type of experiment. So for electricity experiments, this is now going to be some general improvements and errors that we are going to be talking about. So these are some common errors that you'll notice whenever taking these readings. One of these is that the voltage or the currents may be fluctuating. And one of the main reasons for that is your contacts are not very clean. So what you can say is that you can clean the contacts. So sometimes you'll also be working with crocodile clips. So you clean them with wire wool or another alternative that you can write to this is you can say that you can use soldered contacts which don't need to be clean. Sometimes you'll have the voltmeter which is not sensitive enough to take maybe all the readings or like really small readings. So for this you can say that you use a digital voltmeter. And sometimes you'll have again either your V or I too small to measure, maybe even for the digital voltmeter. Now in this case again you want to think about how you can reduce the percentage uncertainty because of the instrument. So you can make some changes. Let's say maybe you can reduce the resistance to make your current larger. So make changes to increase your V and I. So now we are doing some of these other cases where you can run into other problems and these are not very clearly falling into the other categories so we'll be talking about them all together here at once. So these are some more problems that can happen. So for example if you are measuring the object of something which is maybe made out of uh, let's say play-doh or plaster sign for that matter. So you have to take some diameter reading but that object is not circular so the measurement of the diameter would be difficult in that case. Then what you can do is what you normally say for the micrometer is that you take your D readings, diameter readings along different positions and average. and average. 
Similarly, sometimes you might feel that to measure certain angles, it's difficult to line up the protractor because of the thicknesses of these different things as well. And maybe it's also difficult to align that baseline of the protractor so you can clamp your protractor. Sometimes it might also be useful to do the shadow method and then measure the angles using that. Sometimes also trigonometry can really help you out where you use, uh, where you measure different lengths and then you use sine cos tan to calculate the different angles. In external effects, for example, this can happen, let's say if you're doing a magnetism experiment, so maybe you have like uh, cell phones or like a laptop charger nearby that can mess with the magnetic field strength in that case. Maybe you're doing something where you are switching on a fan and looking at how maybe wind blows and similarly maybe in the case of heat as well maybe you can have like uh, if you're sitting in a cold room and if wind is blowing that can uh, mess with those things as well so you can always like say that for example if you're looking at how something moves let's say an oscillation so you can turn off the fan or for example if you're doing an experiment using an LDR so you can turn off your external lights as well so that it does not impact the resistance of the LDR. Slipping and toppling are some uh, common things that will happen when you are doing question number twos. So you can always say that you can clamp certain stuff or provide supports. And just in some cases, you can also say that uh, like you can use some sort of plate or some sort of blocks to weigh something down. Sometimes you may also have experiments related to a pulley, which in my opinion is slightly more difficult to do. But uh, when you talk about the improvements, you can write a lot of these here. So you will have masses which are hitting each other. So you can use a larger pulley. So you can use longer string in this case. Similarly, what you can also do is sometimes you'll have friction at the pulley so you can like uh, lubricate or oil it up and you'll also have an uncertain starting position of the mass when you are doing a pulley experiment so you can always uh, use a card basically to indicate the starting position and similar to pulleys sometimes you'll also be dropping something in air so it's difficult to drop it without exerting a force so you can also have that thing in a pulley so you have like a proper uh, let's say an electromagnet release mechanism so that you drop it without exerting a force and lastly you might have something in which you have to see the water level and it might be difficult because of the refractive uh, effects of this uh, container that you have the liquid in so you can always say that you can use a colored liquid just to make it easy on your eyes so this is all about question number two of your uh, paper three so we've done question number one we've done question number three and these are a lot of the improvements as well as how you can overall tackle question number two so hope this helps guys and best of luck for your exams.